We good? Okay. So um, we are going to get started. I wanted to make a few announcements. Uh, the first midterm is uh, going to be on March 26th. Okay, that date has been on the course schedule since the very first class lecture. This is just a reminder for those of you who may not have seen the course schedule. Every la assignment, every homework, when it comes out, when it is due, all the dates of the exam, final, everything has been posted on the very first day of class. So there should not be any uncertainty as to when that's going to be. So, but I just wanted to announce that it's going to come up. Our spring break is next week, correct? So it will be a week after spring break is when the exam is going to be held. It's going to be an evening exam. Okay. All right. So more about that later. Let's continue from where we left off last time. So if you remember last time we were talking about video streaming okay, and I described to you some of the issues that come up when you stream packets of video or audio over the network which is the internet because internet is best effort it will not guarantee you any performance in terms of the end-to-end -end delay or the loss rate or anything like that okay that end-to-end -end delay may fluctuate from one packet to another and to deal with this you have to employ client-side buffering where you would have to buffer a significant amount of data before you start playing it out in order to deal with the variations from network okay, due to congestion and whatnot. Okay. The other problem that will arise is often uh, you will not be able to deal with loss in a uh, reasonable fashion. If packets get lost during transmission, which they will, if there is network congestion, the network routers might start dropping your packets. Okay. When you send over TCP, TCP will deal with this by actually timing out and retransmitting. Okay, that's clearly not going to work for streaming because you expect the data to have arrived by certain time. Okay? If the data does not arrive, it's lost. Timing out and having it arrive late is only going to cause more playback problems. Okay? So, uh, so late data is as good as no data from a streaming perspective. So one of the things that uh, has been looked at is how do you deal with this in a reasonable fashion. Okay? There are techniques called forward error correction or FEC. Yeah, that are used in the context of streaming okay? and there is an example shown in this slide which is really the simplest possible way to do FEC. There is a lot more sophisticated ways that you can use to deal with loss. Okay, all this is going to do is allow us to spread the loss so you cannot <coughs> perceive it well. Okay? And the example that is shown is on the top here where uh, there are two rows of the packets that you see. Okay. The top row is what was sent and the bottom row is what was received and you will see that in the middle there is a grey region and we assume that the network becomes congested when those packets are sent and all of those packets get dropped and none of them reach okay, the, the receiver. Okay, now if the receiver is playing the video and when you come here there is going to be a gap. Okay. And the larger that gap, the more easily you will perceive that gap which means that your video will appear to skip over some data. Yeah, you'll basically just skip over it and you will see that there is a jerk in the playback. Okay? That will be perceptible to you. Okay? Now to uh, deal with this kind of issues, one simple technique you can do is scramble the order in which data is sent. Okay? So in the top, you will see you are actually sending data in order. Okay? One, two, three packets are sent actually in sequential order. Instead, what you can do is scramble them. So you will take 16 packets and you will basically send them in this order 1, 5, 9, 13. So you basically say in the first four packets are actually spaced four apart. Then you send 2, 6, 10, 14 and so on and so forth. Okay. So now what you will see has happened is you will still send when you send this data you still see that problem in the middle here. Okay. But the packets that get dropped are essentially packets 7, 3, 11 and 15 which means that you are not going to play them out in that order. That won't make any sense. Okay. You still have to play them out in the order of encoding. So what you will actually see is when you play them out 1 through 16, you will see a one packet got dropped here, one here, one here, one here and so on. So your losses, the same amount of loss has been spread out more in the video. Okay. And when you do that, that will be less perceptible to your human eye or if this is audio data, it is less perceptible to the human ear. Okay. Because you will see, if you skip one frame every 10 frames, okay, that is much less perceptible than if you skip 10 frames that are consecutive. 
Okay, so you can spread the losses and that will actually allow you to deal with the same loss rate. Okay, but you the quality of your playback is much improved even with that loss rate. Okay, as one example of what, what you can do, which is in this case, you are simply scrambling the order and spreading the losses. Because in some more sophisticated FEC schemes, you can send some redundant package to try to reconstruct some of the loss data without having to retransmit it. Okay. That is why it's called forward error correction. You use error correcting codes, which we won't go into here. But uh, these, these are some of the ideas that are used in uh, transmission of video uh, streams over the internet. Okay, any questions on this? I'm going to now talk about uh, HTTP streaming. Okay, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, so in the previous slide, in the second case, would there be like an initial delay of suffering at Okay, that's a good question. The question is in the second scenario where you are scrambling the order, will there not be an initial delay before you can start playing it out? It should be very clear that that is indeed true. You cannot play out this entire chunk until you have received all the way till packet 16 because you have to play them out in order. Okay. In fact, packet number 4 is actually coming fairly late. So, you have to wait for all of that data to have come before you can set. So, the startup delay is always going to be longer because you have to buffer all of the data, reassemble it in order before you can play it out. But the assumption is there is always going to be initial buffering to begin with to deal with the jitter problem that I talked about last time. Okay. There is no way you can start playing even in this case when you are receiving packets in order you cannot start playing it as soon as you start receiving data. You have to buffer it for some period of time before you start playing it out. Simply because the delays keep varying and you don't want buffer underflows to happen. Okay, So you are going to leverage the fact that there is already some buffering and you can deal with this reordering in that because of that. Okay, But yes there is going to be this is going to enforce a delay whether you want it or not. Okay, so now uh, let me talk about HTTP streaming. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned last time, although there are many different streaming protocols that are used, which most of which not used, have been developed, most of which are server push based. What has actually happened is most of the players that you use, whether it's a YouTube player or Netflix or any of these players that you use, they actually use a client pull mode okay, to simulate a push mode. Okay. And they essentially not only use client pool, they essentially use HTTP for streaming. Okay. Essentially what is going to happen is your video is going to be partitioned into chunks. Okay. It's not going to be one long file, it will be smaller chunks of files. And they essentially your client player is going to do a get on each of those chunks one at a time. And when, when you are playing the first chunk, you are going to already start sending the request for the next few chunks and start getting it. Okay. And this is how you, so essentially each of these HTTP get is a client pull request. Okay, you are not going to take, get the whole file and start playing it out. That's not going to work. Okay, because you have to then download a very large file before you can even play the first bit of it. So what you will instead do is uh, the, play, the server is going to essentially partition the video into smaller chunks. Okay, maybe a few seconds of that video at a time and each, the player is going to get each chunk and start playing it out. Okay. That's the first thing that you are going to do and this is going to use client pull rather than server push and you are simply doing HTTP get in this case. The okay. same thing you used in your lab. You have a question, yes. Yeah, so if, uh, if a client makes a HTTP request or a press request, so what is the format in which it receives the data back, the video? Okay, question is if the client makes an HTTP get, what is the format in which you get the request? Okay, so the reply HTTP response is going to be MIME encoded. This is the same thing if you download a web page, if it has embedded images, you are going to do a get for each of those image. They will be JPEG or PNG images. Okay? So you can do a get, get for any kind of object. Okay? The standard get is going to get to an HTML file. You will parse that HTML file. If there are images in the file, you do a get for each of those images and the response is essentially going to be an object. It could be a text object, it could be an image object, it could be a video object. The response can send you any kind of object. It will be MIME encoded. Okay, MIME is the same format you use for your mail attachments. Just as you can send PDF objects or images in email, the same thing is going to be used here. Okay. Alright. So that's the first thing that uh, 
you are going to do in HTTP streaming, which is chunk the video and get each part of the video and play it out. Okay, and when you're playing one part, you have to start getting the next few, otherwise there's going to be a playback glitch if you don't have enough data in your buffer. Okay, the second thing that HTTP streaming does, which is an interesting thing that we have not talked about, is it allows you to change the quality of the video playback based on network condition or your uh, device characteristics. Okay, because the same video could be played on a phone or it could be played on your desktop monitor or you could even have connected the large TV that's streaming Netflix. Okay, so the display size could be vastly different. Okay, now if you had only one video file that is to be displayed on all of those devices, then you are going to be forced to encode that video at the highest possible resolution so that it can be played at the best quality on the largest possible device. Okay, and now if you are going to watch the same video on a small phone display, then you are wasting a lot of network bandwidth because you have to still get the video at the full resolution and then essentially only display it on a small screen. That is wasteful. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is you do not know when you encode the video, what is the network bandwidth that the, you have at the client? Is the client watching on a cell phone connection or do you have a Wi-Fi that you are maybe sitting in a coffee shop that's shared with lots of people or maybe you are on a home broadband network where you have good connectivity. So your network condition can be vastly different. Okay? And depending on the network condition, it may only be possible to deliver a certain quality video. Okay? The network is slow, you cannot push out a HD quality video because you are going to have need a lot of bandwidth and you will not be able to send that bandwidth data will arrive late and you will start seeing playback glitches. Okay, So it is required now that the client be able to adapt both to the display of the client device and the network conditions and the conditions could even change over time. Okay? It may be that you have good connection then the network becomes overloaded somewhere the, the bandwidth that you get drops and then maybe it comes back up and so on. Yeah, these things can happen if you are playing a two hour movie, the conditions of the network are not going to stay static over that entire period. Okay? So you need a way to adapt the playback to both changing network conditions as well as the device characteristics. The way you do this in HTTP is you have this technique which is called direct adaptive streaming or HTTP, it's called dash streaming. Okay? There are many aspects of dash but the most interesting one is every video file is going to be encoded at different bit rates. So that is what is actually shown in this picture. This green file version of that file is going to be encoded at low bit rate 128 kilobits per second. You have a better so this is the low quality version of the video. The red in this case is the medium quality version. Okay, Same video encoded at higher bit rate 256 kbps which means the quality is better the resolution is also better. You can display it on a bigger screen. And then you have the red one which in this case is the highest quality. Of course you can have arbitrary numbers of quality that's up to the server as to how many qualities you pick and what bit rate you use. This example is showing you three, okay, low, medium and high quality. Okay. Now what the client will do is it doesn't know which quality to pick a priori. That's going to depend both on the display of the client device and the network conditions. Okay, which might change. So it has to have a way by which it can dynamically pick the right quality. Okay? So maybe what it will do is start in the middle. Okay, you start at the red level because you don't know any better. You will say I know, will neither go low or high. So you start at the red. If the red plays well for a few seconds, you say okay, maybe the quality is good. Let me try to increase the quality. So dynamically when you are doing a get, you can say if you, next time when you ask for the chunk, say I need chunk 3 but give me the blue quality not the red quality okay so the quality will improve and if that quality plays well then you stay at it okay now if you start seeing problems then you drop back again okay so you will drop if you continue to see problem you will drop all the way to the lowest quality which is the only thing you can play at low bandwidth okay so you can dynamically for every time you do a get for the next chunk the player also gets to decide which of these three chunks it wants does it want the the low quality chunk the medium quality or the high quality Okay. And it can keep track of what's happening over the network. Is there a lot of loss? Are you not getting enough bandwidth? Is data flowing slowly? Then you drop your quality. If everything looks good, 
Okay, or if you say, okay, the display resolution is set to high, you want to opportunistically choose as large a quality, good a quality as possible. So you will try to actually go up the quality to the extent the network will let you. Okay, so this, so your uh, client players actually have some intelligence built in. Okay, they can dynamically choose what is the right uh, version to play back. Yeah, and you will see this often if you are playing things on YouTube, occasionally your video may start looking grainy and then the quality becomes better. What is actually happening is in the middle, the quality has been dropped by your player because of some network problem. Okay? As Otherwise, if you keep the static quality, then either you will have playback glitch or you might see lower resolution than the network might allow you to play. Okay? So you can dynamically choose. And there is a lot of work that is still going on into how you pick the right strategy uh, into this quality of streaming, how many encodings to keep and what not. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay, this is all called dash streaming. Okay, this is widely used in most players. Yes, question. So, what if you say that the client pool mode is better than the server push mode over here? Okay, question why did we put client pool over server push? So, there are lots of server push protocols, but they require that you actually implement them in your player or your browser because the browser for many people is the default player. <coughs> Okay, of course, on a phone, you have native apps that play, but on a desktop, you basically use a browser and the browser plays for it. Okay? So, you have to implement them in the browser. Every browser comes with HTTP. Okay? So, you don't need to do anything if you want to use HTTP for your streaming. Okay? Because of its wide compatibility, uh, many players were designed to just use HTTP rather than use a specialized streaming product. Okay, there is no advantage per se. In fact, server push will do the job just as well. In fact, it might do a reasonable job because the client doesn't have to do anything. Okay? But because HTTP is widely supported by all the browsers and browsers are the default way how people were actually watching video, they basically said let's actually use HTTP to get our video and play it out rather than a push mode. So this is why you basically simulate push but you are essentially using pull. Okay, you are going to start pulling uh, the video by actually making requests in advance before you need it. Okay, in that sense, you simulate a push where the data is sent to you before you need it so that you get it by the time you actually need to play it. Okay, so that's what is being done. Any other questions here? Okay, so that's our HTTP streaming mode. And uh, as I said, most of the players that you see will actually use this, not any of what I was talking about last time. Okay. The last thing I want to mention as far as streaming is concerned is stream synchronization. Okay. Typically when you are doing things like audio streaming, there will be at least two sub streams in your uh, things like movie objects and other things. Okay. There is at least a video stream and an audio stream in it okay. because the, they are actually encoded separately. Okay. And in fact, the, uh, not only that, they have to also be played out on two different devices. So, if you get a video, your uh, vi the video part of the, uh, the movie is going to be played on your screen. The audio part is going to be played on the speaker. Okay. So, you have to take your video file and split it into whatever is the image part and whatever is the audio part and play it out separately. Okay. And in doing so, you need to actually, there is a need to synchronize the two. Okay. You want to play the audio component that corresponds to whatever is being seen on the screen. Okay? If they are all out of sync, which means you don't play them in a synchronized fashion, then you will not get lip sync. Lip sync essentially says the audio that you are hearing doesn't seem to correspond with how the lips of the people who are talking move. Okay? If you go out of lip sync, then your playback quality is going to drop because it will look odd when you are watching that video. Okay? So you need the two to be synchronized. Okay, the way you are going to do this is you are going to actually add timestamps to every image that you have in the video and every audio packet that you have. Okay? And then you are going to use this timestamp to ensure that when you play an image corresponding to time t on the screen, you have to actually ensure that the audio corresponding to that timestamp t is actually played out. Okay? So you are going to use timestamp as a way to synchronize. Okay, otherwise, there is no way for you to know what is the audio that corresponds to the video. Okay, so, the way you will do it is when you capture it, you are going to timestamp the audio and the video stream and play them together. Okay. Same thing is going to be true if you are doing a video chat. Okay. In that, you are, in this case, it is live. Okay. So, you basically, let us say you are using your phone or your 
laptop to do a Skype video. Okay, your camera and microphone are going to capture the audio and video separately. Okay, so the two independent devices acquiring data. Okay, and then they have to use the same timestamp so that whatever has been captured at time t is timestamped with the audio that was captured at time t. And then both of those things are sent over the network. At the other end, you are going to use the timestamp to play it out in a synchronized fashion. Okay? So all of these things have to happen for you to see good playback. Yeah, that's called stream synchronization. Question? Do you think uh, apps like Skype or something that they transmit data real time when you talk to somebody, it's like very real time, both like ends? Question is, is the data being transmitted in real time in when you do Skype video conferencing? No, it's like, uh, like suppose you are on one side, I'm on the other side. So do you yes. think like we are very much sync, like we are actually doing the timing very correctly? If you say something, I can hear that in real time. Okay, so if you are doing audio or video conferencing, okay, typically if you want to ensure good communication, there are certain requirements okay, and then there have been lots of human experiments that have said that when you say something, okay, if you are having a normal conversation, you know, let's say face to face, when you say something, the other person to, to perceive that you are actually hearing whatever is being said in real time, you have to receive that sound or image and process it within 100 milliseconds. Okay, if there is a delay, then it doesn't look real time. Okay, same thing is if you are talking on the phone, if the other person doesn't hear what you said, or if the delay is more than 100 milliseconds, then it actually you start seeing lags. Because you expect something, somebody to be speaking, there is a silence because you haven't gotten the data yet. Okay? Same is true of Skype or any video conferencing. As soon as you say something, the your device has to capture it, it has to encode it, it has to transmit it, it has to reach the other end and be displayed and the typical time lags you want are 100 or 200 milliseconds otherwise the quality of your video conferencing will not be perceived as being good or real time. You will start seeing problems. Okay. Now the internet has no way to guarantee that, that is a separate issue but if you want to perceive it as being good quality that is what you want to your application to provide. Any other questions here? Yes. The middle middle layer in the middle in the so that is common for all of the Okay, so this is just a picture from the book, which has a, as you will see, there's a middleware layer, there's an application, and so on. Okay, so and the question is, is that actually common for all applications? This is very specific for a streaming server application. Typically, if you have things like Skype or anything like that, there is no real middleware. All of this functionality is built into the application itself. The OS and the network are giving you best effort delivery. Okay, but there were distributed middleware systems that were designed for streaming, that had a streaming protocol and so on, and you could just do a send and it would decide how to encode it, how to send it and so on. Okay, this picture is drawn in that context. But most applications today are don't use anything like that. And uh, when an incoming stream is, uh, let's say the application has requested for a video, and the incoming stream is coming in, so does it go to the application and then the application tells that like the, it needs to be played on the audio and the display, or does right. it happen by the OSF? Okay, question is when you get some video object or some stream, does it go to the application and the application has to play it out or can the OS play it out? Typically the video or whatever data is coming in is going to be handed to the application. The application is going to decode it, then it has to then say take this image displayed on the screen is going to then take the audio and send it off to the audio device. It will go back to the OS and the OS will actually send it to the right devices. Okay, so it's not that it's going to come to the OS and otherwise the OS would have played it out. You'll see that it went all the way to the application and although it's showing that you showed it on the monitor, that has to come back to the OS and then the OS will do that for you. Okay, any other questions? All right, so I'm going to talk about one last thing and then we will switch to a different topic which is naming. Okay, so uh, we talked about various types of streaming protocols, we talked about stream synchronization and so on. The last thing I wanted to mention was uh, this multicasting of streaming uh, data. Okay? Whenever you have let's say a live sports event or any live event that you are uh, watching online, okay? typically there is going to be a sender 
which is whoever is actually broadcasting that event is the sender okay? and there are hundreds or thousands of users who may be tapped into that event okay now if you do standard unicast okay which that would mean that every time i have to send data if there are let's say thousand users who want to uh, watch that stream i have to do thousand sends okay so i basically i send the data to user one then i send the data to user two i send the data to user three and so on and so forth Okay, that's simply not going to scale as the number of users grow. Okay, so doing n unicast sends is never going to be a good strategy when you have lots of users. Okay, because then every time there's a data to send, I'm going to sit in a while loop and then send it to all my n users. And if n is thousand or hundred thousand, you are going to be stuck. You cannot do that in real time. Okay, so what you want is a way to do group communication. You want to do one send. Okay. And have all the users who want to receive that data just get it based on that one send the user does. No, not the user, the sender does. Okay? That is called group communication or multicast communication. Multicast is just a type of a broadcast. Okay? So and there are many ways to do multicast. You can do multicast at the network layer which is called IP multicast. That is not really used because that requires router support. Okay, what is instead used is application level multicast which is essentially you construct an overlay tree where you have one send there are lots of intermediate nodes that keep distributing the data until they get to the receiver and I'm going to draw a tree here just so that we have a sense of what's going on. Okay. So in this case I draw a tree where the root of the node of uh, the root of the tree is a send is the sender that's sending video. Okay. And the video is essentially going to be done, you essentially do one send for every packet. Okay. And that causes the, the data to flow along the multicast tree and the leaves are the users. Okay. So that's user 1, user 2, user 3, user 4 and so on. Okay. So essentially the data is being distributed through a multicast tree okay, until it gets to the receiver. So the sender has to essentially only do one send. Okay. If a new user wants to tap in, it has to do a job and join the tree somewhere. So let's say a fifth user comes and it does a join it might actually be connected to that node in the tree and now data will start flowing to that node as well as any data is received by this node it will forward to three other nodes not one and so on. Okay? This is basically called multicasting where you are using essentially a tree like structure to distribute data. Okay, each node as you will see each intermediate node has to forward the data to multiple other children until it goes to the leaves of the tree. Okay? But the important part is the sender is only going to send once. Okay? Even though there are five receivers it is not going to do five sends. Okay? Otherwise you would have to open five sockets and send the same data on all five sockets. That is not going to scale. Is that clear? Okay, so this so there are many issues when you do multicasting. You have to decide how you construct this tree. Okay, who are these intermediate nodes that are providing forwarding services? Okay, how are nodes going to join? Where are you going to join them, etc., etc. Okay, that's a big area of research. I'm not going to go into any of those topics here. Okay, I just want to show you a picture that's actually uh, taken from the book, where the whatever is sort of in the cloud are network routers and A, B, C, D are these application level nodes that are part of a multicast tree. And you will see okay, that between any two of these nodes there are actually routers. So when you go from A to C, okay, although there is a direct path you could have followed, okay, because you constructed a tree in this fashion where A has to send to B, B has to send to D and D is the one that is going to forward to C. It only shows you a part of a tree. Okay, not the whole tree is only showing four nodes in the tree. So you, that's how data is going to flow along the black path. Even though there may be a better path, you are actually going to ignore the network topology. You are going to essentially construct an overlay tree, okay, which is an application level tree where you have these nodes that are forwarding data from one node to another. Okay? So there's a lot of work on building these application level trees and these nodes in the middle are essentially doing forwarding functions. A in this case is the sender, C is one of the users that's receiving this multicast data. Okay? And there will be lots of other receivers also that are not shown in this question. So if I'm directly receiving data from the server, uh, I'm receiving it uh, earlier than the lead nodes in the tree? Uh, who is, what, can you repeat your question, who so is? I'm on level one, three, I'm from the server. Yes. I need to propagate this data down and 
Yeah, the question is if you are the will intermediate nodes in the tree receive data before the leaf nodes? Yes, because you are just propagating it hierarchically to the tree. When the resender sends, all the level one nodes in the tree will receive it. The level one nodes will do sends, okay, then they all the level two nodes will receive it and so on and so forth. Okay, because the tree structure will be logarithmic in the number of nodes, there won't be too many levels. But you are right that the leaves are the user, they will receive it at the end of that process. All the intermediate nodes would have received and broadcast it to subsequent levels until it gets to the leaf. Okay, that's how it will work. Yes. So the intermediate nodes are just like proxies? Are the intermediate nodes proxies? In most cases, yes. So you can think of them as proxy servers that are simply providing this function. That's one of the things proxies can do, which is provide forwarding service. Okay. Do they also cache? Okay, question is do they cache the scheme? In many cases, they can actually cache the stream as well because if the next node has not received your data because it gets lost, you can retransmit it quickly. Okay. Typically in streaming, you cannot go all the way to a server and ask it to retransmit because the end-to-end -end delay or the round trip delay is going to be large. But if these nodes are fairly close to one another, going one half to your parent and saying can you retransmit is much faster. So in some cases they will cache or buffer for a limited period of time and retransmit and so There are many different multicast schemes. That's what some of them do. Okay, there was questions on that. Yes. So it's like uh, something like financial data like stock exchange thing. Do they use such a scheme or they have a completely different uh, like, are they related to this? Or? Okay. Question is in financial data can you use? So this is talking about video streaming, but you can use the same technique for uh, Broadcast, multicasting, any kind of data. Because then latency might matter because like right. So if latency from the time you send to the time you receive matters, then you do not want a deep tree. Okay, because the deeper the tree, the more the number of hops you have to trans uh, transfer the data before it reaches the leaf. Okay, so whenever latency is critical, you are going to actually pay extra money to get a direct connection to the sender and so. In case of a large free event that you are watching, okay, if you add 100 millisecond latency and make it scale to uh, 1 million users, you are going to do that because you don't want uh, very high cost at the server. You would rather use a multicast distribution tree to take most of the load. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so we will move on. Okay, to the next topic which is actually the next chapter in the book which is on distributed naming. Okay. So uh, what I will do is talk briefly about what naming and name resolution means. Then I am going to talk about two different systems. One is DNS which many of you may have heard or be familiar with and then the other one I am going to talk is a directory service which also provides naming service okay. and I will talk about things like X.500 and LDAP and things like this. Okay. So what does naming mean? Okay. Essentially in any distributed system when there are resources, okay, we will assume that a resource has a name that is associated with it. When the application or the user wants to access the resource, they essentially refer to it by name. Okay. And then the naming service is going to take the name of the resource and map it to the actual resource that it points to. Okay. That's the problem of naming. Now the easiest way to understand this is to take an example that we are all familiar with, which is the file system. Okay. The resources in this case are files. Okay. Internally, the operating system actually assigns a numeric ID to every file. Okay. Files are essentially numbered. That's how an operating system actually accesses files. Okay. But as users, if you actually have to remember files by numbers and you have lots and lots of files, that's never going to work. Okay. You will not remember files by number. Instead, the, what the operating system allows us to do is actually associate a string which is a name for a file. And you can assign a name that is memorable to you. Okay, You can say that I am going to name my file lab1.python or something like this which I can remember okay, rather than some file number 10,325 or some such thing which is not going to be possible to remember. Okay, Now because internally you are essentially going to use IDs to access resources which in this case are files but users are accessing files by names there has to be a way to take the file name and map it to the actual file it is pointing to. 
Okay? That problem is called name resolution. You are resolving a name by saying, when you say lab1.python, what is the file you actually mean? Because internally the OS only knows files by their numeric IDs in this case. So you have to map it to the actual file ID. Okay? And that resolution process in this case is called name resolution. Same thing is actually going to happen in any naming scheme. Okay? This is just an example where the resources are files, files are names, users or applications use names to access files. The OS has to then resolve the names to the actual file. Okay? Now, uh, in a very large system, when there are lots and lots of resources, you will have the same problem. All the resources will have names. You will have to map the names to objects. Okay? And we will look at many different naming schemes. But if you have lots of objects themselves in your system, your name resolution system itself will need to scale because it might receive lots of requests to resolve it to object uh, IDs. Okay? So the naming system itself might need to be distributed. Okay? Your application is distributed, there are lots of resources, lots of users accessing those resources. So lots of requests saying here go get me object foo. Okay? So you will get lots of these requests. So to scale your naming system may itself need to be distributed. Okay? So in large system, your system, the naming uh, name resolution itself end up being distributed. Okay, so that's the uh, two minute summary of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the class. But now uh, let's go in a little more methodical fashion. Okay, what is actually shown here are two approaches. The one on the left should be familiar to you. That is the card system we talked about when we did peer to peer naming. Okay. That was a name resolution system where you specified keys and it mapped to values. Okay. In a P2P system, you actually specify some file names. It tells you where that object is stored. That's actually telling you where the resource is. So that is actually a name resolution system as well. So you can use uh, essentially a, a distributed hash table, a DHT as a way to do name resolution. Okay. And you can use it in many large systems because that's a distributed naming system. Okay. There are lots of peer nodes that the name resolution is distributed across all of them. Okay. That's one approach and that's basically just what we already looked at when we did peer-to-peer -peer naming, uh, peer-to-peer system. Okay. Now most naming systems actually don't use that approach. They use a hierarchical approach which is shown on the right. In a hierarchical approach, your naming system or the name space is partitioned hierarchically. Okay? And then you have to descend down the name space to figure out what is the object I am trying to find. Okay? This is how you organize your files. Okay? The files are grouped into directories. Directories are themselves grouped into other directories and so on. Okay? So you are, if you look at all the files that are on your machine, they will be stored hierarchically starting with the root directory. Okay, the root directory has some files and some other nodes which are themselves subdirectories. Subdirectories might have other subdirectories and so on. And then what you have at the leaf might be files. Of course, there may be files in other directories as well. Okay? So when you ask the file system to go and fetch uh, some file, your name resolution is actually going to start from the root directory and you are going to look down the directory tree until you get the file you want. Okay, that's how name resolution will work and I'm going to show you that as well. Okay, so although you could build your naming scheme by using a hash based peer to peer uh, naming system, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the class is a more classical hierarchical approach for doing the same thing. Okay, so keep that in mind. Everything we do in the hierarchical you can of course do in the peer to peer DHT fashion as well. Okay. So here is the example I was just talking about, okay, which is in this case, this is essentially a, a directory structure of a machine. Okay. That's the root directory. There are two subdirectories. There's a home directory and the keys directory. The home directory, there are actually user specific directories for different users. And for this user, there is a mailbox directory. That's presumably where the user stores their mail. So if you want to access slash home slash teen slash mailbox that's the name of a file that's the mailbox for that file the way the file system or the operating system is going to figure out what that file is the way you resolve it to the id that i was talking about is you're going to start at the top you're going to start at slash okay, which is here and say is there a directory called home okay you will find that directory here you'll open that directory and say what's the next part of the file name i need to resolve and that's the 
directory called steen. So in home, you're going to say, is there a directory called steen? You say, yes, there is. So then you're going to open that directory and look for the last part of your file name, which is mboxing. Is there a file called mbox in that directory? And then you'll find that file and then you'll say, what's the ID of that file? You'll fetch that and then you would have found that file. Okay. So you have, what we have done here is a hierarchical name resolution, one component of the name at a time. Okay, you have this name that has different parts to it, okay, which are the names of the directories. Okay, and then you are descending down hierarchically trying to find the right object. Okay, this is how most name resolution is going to work. This seems rather trivial, but as you will see, that's how DNS work, that's how most directory services also work. Okay, so you will basically do a hierarchical name resolution. Okay, and so the file system name resolution is the simplest way to understand this. Any questions? Okay, so that's simple. Now, uh, we will come back to distributed file systems in a later class. Okay, but since we are talking about file name resolution, I wanted to explain how this name resolution would work if the file system was distributed. What I showed in the previous slide was all the files are on one machine. Okay, so you just start at the root directory and you find the file you want. What if the files were actually distributed across multiple machines? That this was a distributed file system. Okay, what is shown, that's what is shown in this case is you have essentially this file server which has the same tree that I talked about, this file tree that I talked about on the previous slide. But now here is another machine that can essentially access those files. Okay, now you do this through many different means. Okay. If you are on Windows, you are going to make a network drive that is going to map the files from the server. Okay. If you are on Unix, you are going to do an NFS mount. Okay. You are essentially going to take a volume and you are going to map it to the uh, client machine. Okay. And the same kind of stuff on a Mac. Okay. So I presume you have either heard of NFS or on Windows network drive, same concept, doesn't matter. Okay. Now in this case, you are on this machine, the user will say open my mail. Okay. And you want this slash home slash team slash mailbox. Okay. That is going to be mounted as a network volume or a network drive on this machine. Okay. So files don't reside on the machine where you are trying to access those files. They actually reside on the server. But the name resolution is still going to start at the client. Okay. So you will basically start descending down the tree until you hit a network point. Here you will see that when you try to resolve that file, you will see that it will show the OS will figure out that's actually a network drive. That's a network NFS mount. Okay, So which means the files are actually stored somewhere else. So what it will do is it will transmit the name resolution request to the server saying that's a request that you need to resolve because the files are actually stored there. You do a partial name resolution here. And then you do the rest of the name resolution here. Okay, so you'll essentially descend on the tree, do the name resolution, send back the response. Okay, so in a distributed system, your name resolution request itself might involve multiple machines to figure out what object you are trying to access. Okay, now we'll come back to NFS and all of that later. If you're not familiar with NFS, you don't have to worry about it. Only thing you need to realize is that the user is trying to access an object on this machine, that object resides somewhere else. So to resolve the name for that object, you have to have participation from multiple machines to do the name resolution. Okay, any questions here? All right. So now with that background, we are now going to talk about real naming system. The objective was not to talk about file systems here, but talk about naming system. Okay, so, so now let's take a very large distributed system. Okay, in fact, let's take the largest one, which is going to be the internet or the World Wide Web. Okay, that spans every machine that's connected to it. Okay, hundreds of millions of machines. If you actually add cell phones, now you have billions of devices. Okay, now you can, any machine that has an IP address and a name, you can access. Okay, now if you, the, na the name resolution that we are going to worry about now is you specify a, file, a machine name and you want to map it to its IP address. Okay. You say www.umash.edu. That's the name you will provide to your browser. Okay. The browser has to figure out the IP address of that, mach of that machine. Okay. That is what the naming system will tell us. The naming system that's going to do this translation is called the domain name system of the DNS. Okay. So DNS, okay, among other things, does name resolution where it can take a request and return the IP address of that request. Okay, so whenever your browser, in this case it will be the browser wants to connect to a server, it has to find the IP address. It can't just connect to a string. 
certificate needs to figure out the numeric IP address of the machine. Okay. Now the problem in this case is going to be that you have billions of devices. So you can't have one server that's going to keep a large table for every machine and its IP address. Okay. And then you just give it the name and it's going to give you the IP address. That's just not going to scale. So you need a hierarchical structure. Okay. And that is what the DNS is going to give us. It's going to give us a hierarchical structure and like any naming scheme, it's going to have multiple layers. Okay, so I'll show you an example, but you'll see there's a global layer in the hierarchy, there's administrative layer, managerial layer, and essentially the leaf nodes, which are called zones. Okay, and you will see uh, that's a toy example of what the DNS naming scheme looks like. You'll see at the top are top level domains which you are all familiar with. There's a .com and .edu. There's one for every country in the world which uh, with this uh, two letter acronym for that country and so on. Okay? And then there are lots and lots of other ones as well. So those are all top level domains in our hierarchical scheme. Okay? Now the next layer down are organizations that belong to that top level domain. Okay? So you might have in this case in .edu there will be one node for every university that's part of that. Okay, that's an organization. In .com, which is a very popular domain, there will be one for every company or whoever registered that domain. Doesn't even have to be a company. Okay, so they're all organizational domains. Okay, now if you have a country level domain, you might have a subdomain that might itself be a .com and .edu inside that country and then you might have organizations. Okay, that depends on how the domain name system within that country is organized. Okay, now within each organization there may be departments okay for for example with umass you will have cs.umass.edu okay so the cs is the subdomain within a domain as the computer science department and then you have many such subdomains okay and then within that you might actually have machines okay so if you have www.cs.umass.edu www stands for the web service because so you have mail.cs.umass.edu mail stands for the name of the mail server and every machine is going to be given a name. Okay, it's going to belong to the cs.umass.edu subdomain. Okay, so now if you say I want to resolve foo.cs.umass.edu, okay, you are going to send that request off to the DNS system. It's going to start top down. Okay, one way to resolve it, you are going to say, okay, who is responsible for .edu? Then you are going to say, what's the name server for the UMass domain? You'll get the UMass DNS server. Then you'll say, who's responsible for CS within that? You'll go to the CS server and then you'll say, tell me what's the IP address for Foo. And then you'll get the IP address. Okay, so you are going to do this the recursive hierarchical uh, name resolution. Okay, just as I talked about in the case of the file system, where we started at the root node and we did a recursive disk, and the same is true here. Is that clear? Okay, so that's the basic principle. There are lots of details that we will actually go into. But the other point I wanted to make is uh, what you will see is the top layer is our global layer. Okay, those are the top level domains. They don't change frequently. Okay, you don't actually have new top level domains. They every 10 years or so there will be some new domains that are introduced. Okay, but they don't change at all. Next layer is an administrative layer. So you can go and register a domain if some no one else has used that name before. Okay, so at this layer there are frequent changes because new domains get registered all the time. Okay? So there are more frequent changes than the top level domain. Okay? And then once you have a domain, you can essentially create subdomains and add machines and remove machines. Those changes are even more frequent. Within an organization, you can essentially add new machines and remove machines and so. So the frequency at, of changes actually increases lower in the tree. Okay? Higher up the tree, things are more static. Okay, at the top level there, the things rarely change. Okay? That's something to keep in mind because when we talk about how to improve name resolution performance, we'll come back to that. Okay, the frequency of changes actually is something we are going to exploit to improve performance. Is that clear? Any questions here? Yes, question. Does the mail name system uh, work in the same way? Does the mail system work in the same way? Email? Yeah. Uh, so email, so email uses SMTP, which is a protocol to send email. Okay, but email servers have a name. Okay, so if you send a mail to someone, some domain, you have to first find the mail server for that domain. You are going to use DNS to find the mail server. I'll show you some examples. Okay, 
Okay, so you are going to do any application that uses uh, the internet has to figure out if you are given a machine name, okay, you are going to translate it to an IP address. Okay, so we look at that as well. Okay, so what I talked about here are in the previous slide is summarized in a table here, which is the different layers and then how frequently the names change, uh, uh, name changes and so on. I'll talk about some of these other things about caching and so on in just a little bit. Okay, we'll come back to this table, but let me show some examples for DNS. Okay, now DNS is think of a DNS as a, essentially there are servers in the domain name system, each server is responsible for a certain level in that tree. Okay, so, so there's at the very top there will be a DNS server for .com domain and one for the .edu. So those are the top level DNS servers. Okay, then every organization is supposed to maintain its own DNS server to resolve names. So UMass will have its own domain name server and every company that's in .com will have its own DNS server and so on. Okay, and within that you could have subdomains which may or may not have their own servers, but often they do. Okay? Now each of these domain name servers is going to store entries as records. So essentially think of it as, as a database okay, in each of the domain, uh, domain name servers which will give us some information. Okay? And these are the types of records you can have in your domain name system. Okay? The, the database can have entries that can be of these types. Okay? So the most common type of entry is called an A record. Okay. A record essentially gives you the IP address for the name. Okay. That's what will actually give the name. It has an IP address. I'll show you some example. Then there are many other types of entries. There's an MX record. MX record tells me what's the mail server for this domain. Okay. That is the question that was just asked. If you send a mail to somebody in a domain, okay, essentially you're going to do a DNS lookup, but your mail client will actually look for the MX record or the mail server. will look for the MX record to send the mail to the mail server on that domain yeah, and then there are uh, NS says what's the domain name server for this domain there's a C name which allows you to make aliases I'm going to show you that and there are some others which we won't worry about okay so let me show you some examples okay before I go to name resolution okay so you can actually figure this out by just using there are many commands you can type on the command line so there's one called host to do host www.cs.umass.edu that's going to do a lookup okay, I don't know if anyone can read this probably not let me see if I can make that bigger okay I made it too big right, let me start a new window here okay <coughs> Okay, so I do this and then you will see that it will now, oh, it went and did a lookup and it gave me an IP address. Okay, very straightforward uh, thing and it actually told me that, that if you send mail to that domain, the mail is handled by some other server. That's the mail server that's going to receive mail for that domain. Okay, so the first one is actually an A record and the second one is an MX record. You can do the same thing using a more complex uh, command called NS lookup. I'm going to do the verbose option so you can see all of these things. Okay. So you will see in this case, it actually told me which is, oh, that didn't work. It's not minus four. That didn't work either. I didn't do like verbose. Okay, doesn't matter. So we will do this. And it basically gives us the same information, which is, but what it has also shown us are the machines that are actually responding to that request. Those are the DNS servers. That's actually the main name of the machine. That's the IP address. So it's essentially sending us a, uh, a record. Okay? And you can do this. Let me see if this can do that. Okay, so that is better. So now I did the verbose option. So you will see that what are the information. So you'll see that's an A record here that's basically saying, so when I made that request, it sent it off to several different name servers that are all within the domain. So there is an engineering domain name server. That's the main domain name server for the UMass domain. That's the domain name server for 
it's the CS domain and so on. They all have copies of that record that we are query, which is what's the IP address of the CS web server. Okay, and they all actually send us an A record as well. Okay. All right. And then you will see there there's an MX record there which says what's the mail server. Okay, typically we are sending mail, you are going to look for an MX record. Okay, now we'll come back to that in just a second. Let me show you some other stuff here, which is how name resolution is going to work. Okay. So there are two ways to do name resolution. Both are hierarchical in nature. Okay, we'll always start at the top, but there are two ways to do this. One is iterative, the other is recursive. Okay. In the iterative name resolution, your client is going to start. So in this case, we want to resolve the name ftp.cs.vu.nl. Okay. That's the author's university's FTP server, which is, happens to be Netherlands. NL is domain name for, uh, or the top level domain for Netherlands. So what you are going to do is you are going to start at the top level root name server. Okay, and then you are going to ask that root name server saying this is the hierarchy by the way you are trying to resolve saying what is the main domain name server for the country of Netherlands. So you are going to get that from the top root name server and you will go to the country level server and say who is the domain name server or what is the domain name server for organization VU which is a university in that country and then you are going to get that re response back. Okay, these requests are just sending us responses okay then you are going to say okay what is the domain name server for computer science department in that university you get that response and then you are going to ask what is the to do, do that domain name server say what's the ip address for the machine ftp and then you get a response okay so you are iteratively resolving each part of the name hierarchically starting from the top to the bottom that's called iterative name resolution Okay. The other approach to doing this is what is called recursive name resolution where the client is going to send one request off to the root name server okay, and rather than getting a partial response, the root name servers themselves forward it down the tree, okay, down the hierarchy okay, and then responses flow back up okay, and then you get the final response. So you just made one request to the top and then you got back a response and the hierarchy did the name resolution and got your response. This is called recursive name resolution. Okay? Both give you the same result in the end. Okay? There are just two different approaches for doing name resolution. Okay? Now we want to understand, this is just an uh, example of DNS, but this is by and large true for any naming system. We want to understand some pros and cons of the two approaches. You have a question? How does it look like in that hash thing? How does it actually look like in real life? Uh, Suppose hash cs comma ftp or hash v VU CS FTP. Is, is that corresponding to IP address? No, so I think that you basically it wants the number for IP address for that machine. That's all it's saying. That's not really a, what the protocol is going to do. That's just a figure that illustrates what's actually happening. Okay? So what is going to come back is actually the real IP address. That's what I showed you. Okay, this request is going to be made through that host <coughs> command, for example, okay, or NS lookup command, and is going to either do it right that command line utility can either do it iteratively or it can do it recursively. What will come back at the end at step 8 is the IP address for that machine. Okay. Yes. Um, what is the first step like uh, when the client joins the network? So how does it know which DNS server for the, let's say it could get even a global hierarchy. Okay. How does it know what's the IP address of the DNS? Okay, question is how do you know what is the IP address of the DNS server you want to start? Okay, now th there is a thing that I didn't uh, mention which is this is actually referring to the client's name resolver. That's not the client application. Okay? Typically the way name resolution is going to work is when you have your machine, your machine when it gets an IP address, it will also be given the name of your local DNS server. Okay? All requests have to be sent to a local DNS server which is itself then going to do this. Okay? So you have to have a DNS server somewhere on your LAN okay? which actually knows how to do this. You don't actually have this being done by every end client. Okay? So typically when you specify an IP address for your machine, you are supposed to also specify a DNS server name. Otherwise you will not be able to 
make any name resolutions. Okay? And you can see that uh, if you actually go to, so there's a, uh, in Unix machines, this is typically added, there's a configuration file which is called resolve.com. Okay? When you get a DHCP address, that resolve.com will actually have the name of your local DNS server which has been put here. Okay? So any time now any client on this machine needs to do a name resolution, it's going to simply forward it to that server and say you deal with it and give me a response. Now that server can do iterative or recursive up to whatever it's doing. Okay, of course, in many cases it's going to cache previous results. So most popular requests that are been made recently would already have a response. So you can use the cache entries as well. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. So yeah, clients will just need to know their local DNS servers and they will actually do that process. Okay, so here are, uh, we'll ignore this. Here are the two schemes, iterative versus uh, recursive. And we can now see the pros and cons of the two approaches. Okay? Uh, in this, this is basically just the performance aspect of it. So what it's showing is if you're trying, if the client is trying to resolve the name of some machine that is far away. Okay, in this case, the example is the client, let's say, is in North America. You're trying to resolve that uh, FTP server that's in Netherlands. Then every request is going to make a transcontinental hop. Okay? There's a long round trip time because you are actually going to send that request to another continent and a response comes back. So if you are doing it iteratively, each of those requests is going to make a transcontinental hop. So it will have a long RTT round trip time. Okay? But if you do a recursive, you are going to send that request off here and then it stays within the country and it hops through the hierarchy down and then the results come back and then there is just one response that is going over a transcontinental link. Okay? So, so that's one advantage of the recursive approach where if once you are in the hierarchy, you are basically going to be all typically local. Okay? But uh, if you are going to do iterative, then you are going to go through these longer hops. Okay? So that does, does that mean recursive is always better? Not really, because the other problem with recursive is the, the uh, load on the top level servers is going to be very high because every request starts from there. Okay. So think of everyone in the world, whenever they look at any website or any access, anything over the network, you are going to make a request to the root node of the DNS hierarchy. Okay. Billions and billions of people with phones and every single device you have is going to send off a request to this one node that is going to then forward it to the next level, root level domain. Okay. That machine is going to be heavily overburdened if you do this in a recursive fashion. Now, if you do it in an iterative fashion, what you will realize is every time you do this name resolution, you can cache those entries. Okay, so next time rather than FTP, if I want to go to the mail server or www server, I have already resolved a partial amount of names here. If I cache the entry of the CS name server, I don't have to start at the top. I can simply go and say, last time I asked you for the FTP server, now tell me the IP address of your web server. Okay, so you can cache all of the results that have been of all the requests that have been made previously okay, and use the cache entry is to not start at the top every time. You can start from wherever you left, uh, whatever you have in your cache from that point on. Okay, That's going to reduce the load on these servers. Okay, Now you can ask how long should I cache just a second. Okay? So this is where the what I was talking about as to how frequently changes occur, occur in different levels of the hierarchy matter. Okay. Top level nodes are rarely going to change. So you don't really need to keep asking the root names or who is responsible for .com or .edu. That will not change a lot. So you can cache those entries for hours, days, weeks, however long you want. Okay. Now as you go down the tree, you might have to reduce the, uh, the duration for which you might cache entries because things might change. Okay. So the lower down you are in the hierarchy, the lesser time you are going to cash, but you can still cash for minutes or hours, so it should not be a problem. Okay, your question? Uh, we can do the caching even for the recursive case, right? Because let's say the root server returns you something, it can also return extra information about the rest of the hierarchy along. Okay, question is can you cache in the recursive case because 
the root server can send you partial information. What you have to realize in this case, the root server is only giving you a final response. It's not giving you any of the intermediate results. The intermediate results are actually all st only stored in the hierarchy itself. Okay. What if, like, obviously, like, it might be a protocol, but what if everybody sends, like, keep, like, keep sending the lower node information higher up the hierarchy? Okay. The question is, could you send information of partial results back to the node? Okay, so you could, but then it's no longer hierarchical or recursive. Recursive means you always have to start at the top by definition. Okay, if you could directly go here, you're essentially doing a form of iterator. That's what you essentially did. Okay, if you could just start from anywhere in the middle, that is essentially saying I'm going to resolve from that point on downwards. Okay, but yes, I mean you could do some hybrid approach, but that's besides the point in the terms of still you are always going to start from some node and go back down which increases the burden on those nodes. That's something you want to keep in mind rather than having the clients directly talk to whoever they want. Okay, so pros and cons. I mean it's not that the one is always better than the other. Okay, the iterative can, is more naturally able to take advantage of cache. That's the thing to keep in mind. Any other questions here? Okay, so that's recursive versus iterative. Okay, I'm going to show you some more examples. This is just DNS entries from the picture taken from the book. It just shows you these are the records that you see in a DNS uh, server. So you will see there are for every machine, you can have an A record that says that name for that machine as that IP address. You can have an MX record saying if you want to send mail to that machine, go to that web ser mail server instead and so on and so forth. Okay? And you will see there are several interesting things here. One of those things you will see is this machine star.cs.vu.nl actually has two A records, okay? two IP addresses. So typically this is used for things like, uh, and uh, let's see, does it have a, yeah, so typically you can actually associate one name with multiple IP addresses. This is used for things like DNS load balancing. Okay? So I'm going to show you an actual example to make it much more clear. Okay, so let us try to resolve, uh, let's say Netflix. Okay. So if you actually resolve the name for Netflix, you will see that it returns to you seven different IP addresses. Okay. So basically the service is replicated across all of those machines. Okay. So it's returned to seven. In fact, if you ask for that request again, it will return you the same seven, but in a different order. Okay. What your browsers typically do is they just take the first entry and connect to that because all of those IP addresses can actually give you the same information because the service is replicated across all of them. So if you return those entries in a different order to different browsers, okay, different clients will connect to different machines in that cluster and your load is automatically distributed. Okay. So every time you make a request, you will see that it will permute the order in which you get those entries. And the browser by default will take the first entry. So different browsers will connect to different ones and you get load balance automatically. So this is called DNS load balancing. So you can replicate and use DNS to do load balancing. Okay. That is why in this case, one IP, one name has multiple IP addresses. Okay. You can also have the opposite where one IP address has multiple names. Okay. This is called aliases. Okay. So for example, uh, the class website that you have, let's resolve that, okay. So if you say, if I want to go to the class website stored on that web server, if you try to resolve that, you will say that that's an alias for that machine. That machine actually has that IP address, okay. So essentially that one IP address has multiple names pointing to it. There's a real name and a bunch of alias names, okay. So you can have multiple names for an IP address. You can have one name that maps to multiple IP addresses. So there are many different uh, things you can do. So in this case, that's a C record. Okay, so you will see in this case, if you go back to the uh, slide. Okay, so you will see there is a C name. Okay, in this case, this web server okay, is essentially an alias for that machine. So if you connect to that web server, you will basically be told to go look, do a lookup on that machine and then that machine actually has an IP address. Okay, so that's the real name, that's an alias which is called a C name record. Okay, so you can have these different features in uh, uh, DNS. Is that clear? Any questions?
Right? Now DNS can have other interesting things which have nothing to do with naming. Uh, in many cases, the result that DNS can return to you can actually differ from client to client based on their location. Okay. So you could now not uh, do what Netflix did which is have 8 responses and say connect to any one of them. Okay. You can actually say where is this client making the request from. Okay. And say if you are making a request from Massachusetts, I am going to send you the response that is the closest server to Massachusetts. Okay. So that essentially does geographic load balancing where you are sent to the nearest machine rather than being asked to go and pick from one of many replicas. So there are many services that will replicate across different sites or different locations and they are intelligent enough to figure out when you make a request depending on where you are making that request or which network you are making the request from you will get a response to a replicated server that is nearby. So you get better performance. So you can do that kind of optimization as well. Okay. When we come back to content distribution network, we will look into this. Because CDNs will essentially have the content cached across lots and lots of proxies. And if you try to connect to a machine okay, the, or a web server, it will send you to a nearby proxy, not the actual server. Okay, that's how it will do the resolution. Okay, so we have five minutes left. I'm going to quickly talk about directory service. Okay, so DNS is one kind of naming service. It's global in scope. It's hierarchical. It scales to the entire internet and they all do use the lots of different optimizations, caching, you can do DNS load balancing, lots of different features. Okay? But at the end of the day, what DNS is, is a very simple lookup service where you give a name, it gives you an IP address, okay? key value lookup. Okay? The key is the name, the value is the answer, which is the IP address. Okay? You cannot do any more complicated queries. Okay? You cannot say, give me the list of all IP addresses within the computer science department. That kind of query you cannot make. Okay? If this was a full-fledged database, you could write a SQL query. Okay? You could do something which says, give me you, uh, all the machines and that's a very uh, different kind of query than a key lookup. Uh, uh, query. Okay? Now there are many directory services where you do want to do precisely those kinds of queries, not simple lookups. Okay? So you want to have more sophisticated naming schemes. Okay? Simple <coughs> example is you want to actually look up, uh, let's say, yellow pages, okay? which will give you business names and their phone numbers. Okay? So let's say you want to look up uh, plumber. Okay? So now rather than typical directory, you have a name and you get somebody's phone number. That's what a telephone directory gives you. Okay? But now if you say give me all entries that match the type plumber, that will give you a list of responses. There's no longer a key value. You're not giving a name and asking for somebody's phone number. You're actually saying here's an attribute for that name. Give me all the entries that match that attribute. Okay? So that you could never do with a DNS. but a more general purpose directory service will allow you to do more sophisticated queries of this sort. Okay? Again, the naming scheme is hierarchical, but you can specify more complicated lookups or queries on this naming scheme and get different kinds of responses. Okay? So, X.500 directory service does exactly that. It's a more sophisticated type of a lookup service. Okay? And then the yellow pages is actually runs on this kind of directory service. Now, you may have heard of this term LDAP, which is an acronym that, that stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Okay? So this is a simplified form of X.500, which is widely used in most organizations. This is a very general directory service that allows you to do all kinds of lookup. This is where username and passwords are stored. When you try to log into a network machine, you specify your username and password. It goes to an LDAP server. Okay? and says here is the username, this is the specified password, does it match? If the answer is yes, then you get to log in, otherwise it will tell you to try again. Okay? So that is one kind of look. It can also be used to store uh, your uh, contact information. So if you go to a UMass web page, you will see that there is something, a people finder there. Okay? People finder is essentially an online phone book where you can specify somebody's username and it will give you their phone number and you can specify a first name or just last name you don't have to specify a full name it will give you all matching entries okay because you say find me all entries that match last name Shinoi 
it will give you everyone who is registered in that directory service with that last name. Okay? So that is the same as saying give me all uh, entries that match type plumber or electrician in your phone book. Okay? So that is the kind of stuff you can do with LDAP. You know, there are many implementations of this. In Windows this is called Active Directory okay, or AD server. In Linux you have open LDAP which is an open source implementation of LDAP. Okay? And so uh, as well in a Mac. Okay, so, so this is what is used in most Unix or, or not even Unix, most general purpose operating systems to store all sorts of information within an organization. Okay, usernames and password, names of printers, locations of printers, names of users, their contact information, their address, whatever you want to store can be stored here. Okay. You have to of course construct a schema just as in any database you can store whatever information you want but you need to create tables and tables as schemas and so on. So is the case in LDAP. You have to create schema so you can store user profiles, access privileges, network resources and so on. Okay, and then it gives you a standard way to do lookups and then you can go and look it up. Okay. So here is an example of the same thing that we have been talking about but within an organization you can actually store this within LDAP. Okay, you do not use DNS inside an organization, you actually use LDAP to do lookups. Outside organizations you can actually do a DNS, DNS is actually cross domain. Okay, within an organization you can actually use this as your first level of name resolution. If you don't have the entry here you go and ask DNS. Okay, that's how you can set up your name resolution. So all the username and uh, host, uh, host names rather not username, host names and IP addresses can also be stored in LDAP servers or active directory servers. That's how you can do internal LAN level lookups. Okay? If you want to go on the internet then you can use DNS. Okay? And now what is shown here, actually there is a picture here. Okay? So you have the same hierarchical structure in LDAP where you will have a C entry, C stands for country, there is an O entry, O stands for organization, there is OU entry, OU stands for uh, the organizational unit, there is CN which is the common name and then you have the host name at the bottom. Okay? So that is the schema where you have these types of record, there is a C record, an O record, OU record that creates a schema that allows you to go do lookups at of various kinds. Now if you connect to an LDAP server, you have to actually specify the schema you want to use so that the LDAP server can use that to make the right kind of queries. Okay, So you can actually go to people finder, it is actually an LDAP service. It will tell you what the schema is if you want to configure that in a client and so on. Okay? You configure that in your mail client for example, you can just type somebody's last name, it will go look up their email address and auto complete for you. Yeah, so most mail clients will provide you that service. So you don't need to know the mail, email address of people in your organization. If you know their name, you try typing their name, it will show you all matching entries as you are typing in and pick. That is something it can provide and many other examples like that. Okay, questions? Alright, so we ran two minutes over time, so I am going to stop here. We will continue on Wednesday. Okay, there is a storm coming. So if the snow storm closes closure, we'll reschedule. Otherwise, we'll see you on Monday or Wednesday. Okay. That wasn't the metaphor for the midterm. No, well, that too. <laughs>